act as a new IT, we should be uh, bringing pride to old IT system. And old IT system should say that, oh, uh, look at this new IT, which has done even better than what we have done. Having aspiration is not enough if I'm not motivated. Mm -hmm. I aspire to write the best-selling novel, but I'm not motivated. Mm -hmm. To bring any significant change in a university or in any organization, you need a combination of the people who are part of the system, who have the uh, experience of the past, who have had the background on the legacy. Namaskar. Uh, I am Ravi Gupta. Uh, I represent the elites of Techno Media and we uh, publish Digital Learning Magazine. And uh, today it's my honor uh, to be here at the Banaras Hindu University. And I am here uh, with the Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, Professor uh, Sudhir uh, Jain, who is uh, a Padmashi awardee. And also, he is one of the most renowned uh, higher education uh, professors and also uh, administrators in the country. And uh, his, uh, whatever he says, speaks, and does is being watched by the people across India and also, of course, across uh, across the world in the higher education sector. I will be asking him uh, uh, regarding his like journey. Uh, from a professor uh, to an administrator and a chancellor. So, uh, welcome, sir. It's an honor. Uh, Thank you, Ravi. Mm. It's an honor here. And I will sir, start with uh, asking you that I have seen you uh, teaching uh, earthquake engineering at uh, IIT Kanpur. And uh, from being a teacher and a professor, you moved uh, to lead the IIT Gandhinagar, which was at a very, very nascent stage when you joined. And uh, I think uh, anyone else uh, would have been scared to like take up a, a job like that. And you took it up and started in a makeshift uh, campus. I have like seen you uh, there. And you have created a beautiful uh, institution called IIT Gandhi Nagar, which is considered one of the top IITs of the country now. So uh, asking you that, uh, what was the different approach you took up as a, a building a new institution? And, and what challenges you faced. If you can talk about this journey, it will actually inspire many others. The way I saw that a uh, lot of us in academics get a chance to teach, to do research. Some of us also get a chance to be heading an institution uh, as a director of an institution, as a vice chancellor of an institution. Very few of us get a chance to create a new institution. And to me, that was a very, very privileged position, not only for me as a director of the institution, but also for all my colleagues and students. And I used to say this to my students and teachers and non-teaching staff, that this is a rare opportunity for all of us to put our hands together and work as a team and build a very different type of an institution that India aspires to have, something that will have uh, all the good things that should be there in a new institution because we don't have legacy challenges of uh, things that are difficult to undo. And therefore, my entire approach during my years at Gandhinagar was that we are a new IIT. We will learn from the experiences of the first generation IIT system. We will adopt good practices from them, but we will also safeguard ourselves against things that did not work in the old IITs or the problems that old IITs faced after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of their existence. And therefore, we have an opportunity to design a new IIT that will be, in the long run, doing better. And I used to think that just like as parents, we always want our children to do better. We want our children to have those opportunities, those privileges, those benefits that we did not have. Similarly, I felt that as a new IT, we should be uh, bringing pride to old IT system. And old IT system should say that, oh, uh, look at this new IT, which has done even better than what we have done. So that is how we worked. Sure. Yeah. Uh I, I have uh, seen personally that at IIT Gandhi Nagar, you brought a more holistic approach in the engineering education. I saw you like uh, bringing in uh, experts in history, arts, 
and theater and uh, many other like dimensions uh, archaeology and uh, what not and uh, which are not uh, uh, taken uh, very like these are the topics not uh, taken very very like seriously in engineering uh, institutions so why uh, did you like think about uh, these things which were like just out of the box i suppose <laughs> <clears throat> well, not as much out of the box as people make them out to be. If you look at any good report on undergraduate engineering education yeah. from any reputed group or reputed institution, they all would talk about the need for engineers to be more broad based. They would want engineers to not only know how something is to be done, but also why something is being done. If an engineer does not know why we are doing something, what are its impact, what are its implications, they will be reduced to technicians. And the overall leadership will be with people who know why something is being done, how it has to be done, what are its implications, mm -hmm. and they will just hire the engineer to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So, my view was that as a premier institution, uh, as an IIT, we had a responsibility to produce future leaders mm -hmm. who will solve societal problems, who will mm -hmm. provide leadership. Mm -hmm. And therefore, our graduates had to be uh, very broad based, they should be very grounded. Mm. So on one hand, they should have a global aspiration mm. to be the best in the world. They should know where the rest of the world is going, what the rest of the world is doing, but they also should be very aware of realities of India, the uh, challenges of Indian society. Mm. Only if you can give them this perspective of where we are and where we should be, uh, they will find a way to reach there. And uh, they were bright uh, students who had come through competitive exams, very difficult exams. Now it was our responsibility to prepare them to solve India's challenges, society's challenges. And that is why it was very important for us to teach them not just only engineering, but teach them about uh, humanities, about social sciences, about natural sciences, about various subjects mm. and get them grounded in the realities of India. Sure. And sir, after like creating this imaging institution called IIT Gandhinagar, uh, which is actually flourishing even after you have uh, lived there, which uh, shows that how much uh, deep the uh, foundations you have created in that ecosystem. Uh, you have moved on to this uh, huge responsibility of uh, taking up the uh, uh, leadership of Banaras Hindu University, which is one of the uh, oldest and uh, uh, highly prestigious universities of the country. Uh, uh, it has a huge, uh, rich legacy, uh, rich, uh, diverse departments, one of the uh, large uh, faculty sizes it has and a large number of students in various departments including engineering to humanities to sciences to uh, performing arts to various other things so uh, it is uh, again i you said that uh, perhaps it, uh, uh, it uh, would have been a huge responsibility uh, you would have uh, thought about it so what are the uh, things like you have to uh, learn again or unlearn uh, from moving uh, from leading uh, engineering institutions to a wide and diverse large university like UG. I, I, I feel I have been very privileged and very fortunate to have had such wonderful opportunities in my career. Uh, I started with a narrow outlook of an earthquake engineering expert who was teaching earthquake engineering. As I moved in my teaching and research career, I realized that earthquake cannot, engineering cannot be seen in isolation. And we have to see it in the context of civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So I started to think about uh, how can civil engineering do better so that earthquake engineering. Yes. And then slowly you realize that civil engineering cannot be seen in isolation. Mm -hmm. You have to see in the context of overall engineering education. And therefore you have to see how engineering education has to be better so that civil engineering can be better. And therefore it was a natural progression for me mm -hmm. to think of how our education has to be better so that engineering education can be better. So I would say it was a 
very interesting, very privileged opportunity for me to be at Banaras Hindu University as its Vice Chancellor. It is a, a glorious institution with glorious history of more than 100 years, uh, set up with a very ambitious plan as you can see the kind of size of the university the kind of breadth of the disciplines that its founders had planned <coughs> more than 100 years back uh, it has produced some uh, <coughs> eminent scholars uh, and eminent leaders uh, who have solved uh, or contributed to solve india's major challenges so it has been a great privilege to be working here but then I recall when uh, my name was announced for Banaras University, one of my colleagues and a friend called me on the phone and he said uh, same thing that you are asking. Uh, you have been in an engineering college uh, type person, you have studied in engineering institution. Uh, for your undergraduate, you went to Rootkey. For master's and PhD, you went to again Institute of Technology, California Institute of Technology. You taught always in Kanpur IIT again, Institute of Technology, and you were leading IIT Institute of Technology. How do you see yourselves as a Varanasi University Vice Chancellor, which has medical college, which is law college, which is management college? And my answer was the same that I'm going to give you today. I said, look, all my years at Gandhinagar, I used to tell my students that you need to learn to learn and that entire life you have to keep learning. I said, look, <coughs> I have been learning as a teacher for 25 years at Kanpur, I have learned as a director of the institution at IIT Gandhagar. It was certainly not something that I knew what needs to be done on day one as I uh, worked at IIT Gandhagar. I learned new things and I learned how to improve things and how to do better things. I said the same journey continues and the only thing is that I need to learn a lot more now. Uh, than I needed to do in the past. So uh, I would say that uh, I came to BHU with a clear idea in my mind that it is a new uh, territory and I will have to learn afresh many things and unlearn many things. And uh, this is indeed uh, something that came out to be true. The governance system of the IIT system is very different from the way uh, universities in our country are run and therefore I had to do a lot of learning and unlearning. Sure. Uh, you have, uh, sir, uh, been uh, studied at IIT Roorkee, then you have moved to IIT Kanpur, then created this whole IIT Gandhi Nagar, then you are at BHU and you are part of the various uh, uh, top level committees of the Government of India regarding higher education policy. You have also uh, uh, studied at uh, Caltech and uh, you have been awarded as one of the most eminent of alumni, uh, which is a matter of huge pride. So uh, 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 you have been exposed to a very diverse uh, 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 set of uh, education institutional ecosystems across and uh, not only in India, but outside India. In this whole uh, changing world, and uh, there is a constant uh, talk about AI, which will make things everyone like a lot of people unemployable or unemployed, and it will change the nature of the various industries. Things are high, changing at a very very rapid pace, uh, both in terms of employability and then the demands of the employers uh, or the demands of the uh, ecosystem from an education institution. So how do you and uh, on the other side, uh, Honorable uh, PM has uh, given us a, a mandate of creating a Vixit Bharat by the year uh, 2047. How do you uh, see the role of higher education ecosystem uh, in India? And how will uh, higher education ecosystem prepare the students for, for creating the Vixit Bharat? And what changes and reforms are needed in this uh, higher education ecosystem, if you can reflect upon these points. See, there are several questions in uh, what you asked. Uh, firstly, how important is education? Yes. To my mind, <coughs> education was always very important, but it has never been as important as it is today. When more than 200 years back, uh, 
the British came to India to exploit India's uh, economy, India's uh, wealth, they needed to personally come here. They needed to personally send their young people who had to live in relatively harsh conditions uh, mm. away from their homes. Uh, but today, with the uh, IT uh, tools available, uh, you don't need to send somebody to another country to exploit its economic resources. Today, uh, we all depend on um, IT devices, IT softwares, uh, uh, which are done elsewhere because they have good universities. Uh -huh. Those are done elsewhere because their universities are producing outstanding thinkers and problem solvers uh -huh. who are able to produce those products and those uh, services uh -huh. that the rest of the world is buying. Yes. Today, if you see some of the richest companies in the world, they are not those who are making cars or those who are not those making steel. Yeah. They are those who are uh, in IT industry. And the entire IT industry works on intellectual work that requires universities to produce its graduates who will uh, do something uh, creative, something interesting, something that will solve society's needs. So when you look at economy, uh, education has become far more important than it was uh, 50 years back or 25 years back. Similarly, the defense uh, depends today a lot more on electronic warfare and uh, other technological tools than it did 25 or 50 years back. So again, that will depend on what kind of graduates you are. So to uh, answer your question, the first part is the there has never been a more critical time than what it is today for educational enterprise, educational ecosystem to play a critical role in the country's economy as well as in defense. Now, having said that, the question then is, what do we expect our universities to do? We need to realize that universities are not to teach only the subject. It is not only about doing the exam. It is not about the grade cards. It is not about the certificates and the mark sheets. It is about preparing a young person for life. It is about preparing a person to uh, lead a fulfilling life making contributions. If I were to define education, uh, my thought would be that a good education should give to the young students an aspiration to do something worthwhile, something positive. It should give motivation for them to meet that aspiration. Having aspiration is not enough if I'm not motivated. Hmm. I aspire to write the best-selling novel, but I'm not motivated. And then it should also give the student the tools and the capabilities to meet that aspiration. Mm. So it is not good enough for me to want to write, having aspiration to write a great novel mm. and be highly motivated. Mm. But if I don't have the uh, command on the language, if I cannot be creative, if I cannot think to write that novel. Mm. So to me, an education is about creating an aspiration, a motivation, and then providing the tools and capabilities to the student. So when I teach a student the subject, whether it is medicine, whether it is law, whether it is physics, really it is the third part, the capability part mm -hmm. that I'm contributing. But what about the first two, the aspiration and the motivation? Mm -hmm. That is what the university should provide. Mm -hmm. That is something that cannot be done through online educational resources. Mm -hmm. That is what where we need teacher-student uh, engagement. That is where we need teachers themselves who understand this expectation. Uh, it will not do if a teacher thinks that his or her role is limited to teaching the subject. It will require teacher student to have an engagement, to have communication and where the students will feel inspired to have that aspiration. Now, this is what I think the educational enterprise has to move towards. And for this, 
to happen the requirements are not only that you need to have good people good teachers you need to have good resources good buildings good laboratories good infrastructure good campus but you also have to have good governance systems and good culture in the uh, educational institution because if you hire a very good person and give him very good resources but then the whole atmosphere is such that he or she is not able to engage with the students in a meaningful manner mm -hmm. we are really not getting good advantage of the presence of that person mm -hmm. and being given such good mm -hmm. uh, resources now how do you create that culture and how do you create that uh, governance model that is where we need to think very seriously the way i think is that the way the corporates govern themselves mm -hmm. the way the government runs the business they are different mm -hmm. if you run the corporate as a government or if you run the government as a corporate you will not succeed mm -hmm. similarly how the university should be run is different if you run a university like a government department mm -hmm. or if you run a university as a corporate mm -hmm. you would do grave injustice to the university and to the students that you are graduating universities have their own requirement of how they should be operated now one can perhaps do a big discussion on it and one can write scholarly articles and there are a lot of articles available already on this topic but if i were to summarize very briefly the basic requirement of running a good educational enterprise one of those is shared governance okay where the policies and the norms the rules they are not dictated from top they are collectively developed where everybody feels empowered everybody feels that they are part of the uh, operations part of the management of the institution the second thing is shared values we have to have a common understanding of what are the values that our university is subscribing to if we have different opinions somebody says that every student should pass and somebody else should say says that uh, no only those who are meritorious should pass and those who are not learning the subject they should fail oh. now if on this basic thing you cannot agree then there is no hope that a university can do justice with its students similarly whether it is discipline matters mm -hmm. all right a student has done mm -hmm. uh, some act of indiscipline which is serious enough that the student uh, may have to be asked to leave for a semester for a year mm -hmm. uh, and somebody says no 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 it will affect his career mm -hmm. while somebody else says no 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 we must have a punishment for that mm. i think it is very confusing for people and right? it is not good for the good governance of the institution mm. so to my mind having shared values of how things will be generally viewed are basic minimum requirements if you don't have shared values then you can't have shared governance mm. so shared governance and shared values come together if you can ensure that and if you can empower your people if you can give them free hand if yeah. you can say that we will trust you to do the right things we will not tell you how to do things they will be inspired to find good ways of doing things to find innovative ways to do things to improve things but if i tell them how exactly something is to be done i am really Uh, curtailing their thinking, curtailing their innovation, and if I do this to my colleagues, my faculty colleagues, and if they are not innovating, how will they train the students to innovate? So this whole uh, chain of uh, delegation has to be developed where a lot more things are delegated, and people are given freedom and uh, flexibility. and autonomy of course they must be accountable uh it is like if i give a department head a budget of let's say 10 lakh rupees let the head of the department decide what the department needs rather than i telling them out of 10 lakh rupees how much can be bought 
uh, can be used for this purpose and that purpose. But then there is accountability that the 10 lakh cannot be abused, cannot be misused, cannot be wasted mm. and uh, no injustice can be done to the mm. uh, to a section of the faculty in the department compared to the other section. So in other words, we need to give a lot more autonomy mm. to our people together with accountability and to do so we need shared uh, values. This to me is a area that our universities have to work uh, proactively. If we are to produce graduates who will solve India's problems and make India a developed country. Sure. And sir, I will uh, also like to talk about the uh, uh, role of uh, uh, private sector higher education, which is emerging in a big, big way. There are uh, several uh, hundreds of private universities today. I think in the last decade, uh, this whole uh, growth has happened. And uh, uh, those students who are uh, like uh, not able to get into the highly competitive government uh, uh, institutions are going to the private universities or even going abroad. And it is being uh, seen as a like uh, someone uh, looks at it as a threat, someone looks at it as an opportunity. And uh, if you look at the last decade, the uh, the whole higher education ecosystem like is like changing the, like what was happening in the school sector earlier. Everyone like most of the people were going to government schools. I went to a government school. And, and now my children are going to a private school. So the, there's a, sh a shift happening. And I, I think another shift is happening about uh, students going abroad. And uh, uh, so lots of like uh, millions of dollars of uh, uh, foreign exchange of India is going there. It is being looked at as a serious threat to our economy itself. So the uh, the higher education ecosystem has like uh, so many dimensions in terms of policy, employment, employability, admissions. Like look at the whole uh, the coaching industry which has evolved and it is uh, flourishing. So uh, 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 this sector is so much important from a citizen's perspective, from a common man's perspective. And uh, 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 like how did, uh, does a uh, institution like you deal with it or a, a policy maker deal with it that uh, so many things are changing uh, very very fast in this ecosystem so how do and now the government has allowed the foreign universities to open campuses here the, uh, 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 like some of the campuses have already started in like uh, in the good city itself it has started in Gujarat and some are like going to come. So if you look at this ecosystem uh, from a uh, student perspective or a parent's perspective, their choices have increased, their uh, demands have increased and are the government institutions like changing fast enough to uh, meet those demands? So uh, how do you like reflect on these dimensions? So, first of all, uh, education is one sector hmm. which is uh, not a zero-sum game. Yes. Uh, there is space for everybody. Yes. And the way I see it is that the private institutions are not going to hurt the public university. Hmm. If at all, they will contribute to the public university and vice versa. Any good educational ecosystem will benefit from diversity. Huh. So when you bring uh, private uh, universities, when you bring foreign universities, you are really adding more diversity. Huh. You are adding new uh, methods of doing things, new methods of governance. You are bringing new practices. And if we all want to open our mind huh. to the possibilities, we will have enough to learn from them. So as a public university, uh, product and as a public university employee all my life, mm. 
डू आई सी प्राइवेट यूनिवर्सिटीज और फॉरन यूनिवर्सिटीज इज थ्रेट टू पब्लिक यूनिवर्सिटीज आंसर इज टू मी ऑनर्स इज ऑन अस इन द पब्लिक यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम टू ओपन अवर माइंड ऑब्जर्व दम केयरफुली and see what are the good things that they are doing that i can learn from what are the good things that i can bring to my universities if we go with that mindset that we are here to contribute to uh improve our own institutions okay let me say one more thing i said already that education enterprise is not a zero sum game uh, if somebody gains it does not mean i lose in fact if somebody gains it helps me to gain the mm-hmm. bottom but there is also second thing which is important that there is no upper limit to excellence mm-hmm. so you may think you are doing extremely well mm-hmm. it does not mean that you cannot do better so there is always room for doing better and better and better mm-hmm. now if somebody says i am doing well because i am better than such and such universities or i have better ranking than any other university uh, and therefore i am happy i think there is a problem we always have room for improvement therefore to my mind public universities have to see the private universities and the foreign universities as an opportunity hmm. uh, where they can improve themselves further they can learn from their best practices and there can be a very healthy uh, competition uh, between the public universities between the private universities hmm. and between the public versus the private universities same thing is with the foreign universities hmm. and i would say same thing is with the indian students going abroad to my mind the fact that so many billion dollars are going outside is a economic challenge uh, it is uh, not a good thing for our economy that our students are not finding good enough opportunities to learn in india that they have to go outside to learn especially at a young age uh, somebody going for higher studies and getting trained in a very specialized area is one thing mm. but somebody going after doing his 12th class mm. to get an undergraduate degree mm. to me is a more serious uh, problem in a broader sense mm. not just in terms of the dollar going but the fact is that if uh, you send your child at a very tender age mm. the chances of they coming back to india and contribute to india's economy become much much lower mm. then if the same person were to go at a older age and therefore you don't want to lose lot of your good uh, human resource uh, to foreign countries uh, not just for the education but post that degree or post that education having said that i think the challenge is for us to improve our educational enterprise both private universities and public universities so that our young people will find good enough opportunities to study in india rather than have to go abroad yes. i would not in any way uh, say that it is uh, bad for somebody to send children abroad or anything like that but i would say it is important for us to improve our sense more sure and uh, and sir, sir uh, i would uh, like to like reflect uh, and request you to like talk about uh, a bit about uh, what are the Uh, changes uh, you have uh, brought in your stint here uh, it's it's uh, like it's been a, like a, a short time itself mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. and uh, making a change in a large university is like yeah. uh, in tg so if you can like uh, uh, talk about like, some of the initiatives so <laughs> if i have to talk about what uh, happened during uh, my tenure here at bhu as its vice chancellor uh, i think lot of issues regarding administration uh were causing difficulties to our people or our students or teachers uh, there were a lot of red tape lot of bureaucratic delays people had to run around to central office to get their papers cleared uh the payments were being held up the money was not being uh, released in timely manner to various uh vendors to students to even faculties bills many times were not being released in time so our first and most important focus was to improve our administrative processes we did that and i would say today the system is much more responsive 
and much more accountable for uh, delivering what it is supposed to deliver. Uh, to do that, we needed to uh, communicate, we needed to set the benchmarks, we set, needed to set the expectations, but we also needed to bring some structural changes. For example, uh, just to give an example, uh, when I uh, looked at the way sponsored research projects at BHU were handled, uh, it was very bureaucratic and it was causing a lot of delays and the teachers were getting very frustrated that if they get a grant from Department of Biotechnology or Department of Science and Technology, it was a lot of hassle for them to operate those projects. So we created a uh, cell, we called it Sponsor Research and Industrial Consultancy Cell with a mandate that no paper should be there with you for more than 72 hours and everything should be cleared on a fast track uh, and it should be a single window type of a system where the faculty member does not have to go to different uh, units of the university for their sponsored projects. So we did those kind of uh, structural changes. We also brought in uh, diverse talent because uh, to bring any significant change in a university or in any organization, you need a combination of the people who are part of the system, who have the uh, experience of the past, who have had the background on the legacy, uh, who have the connections, who have the history, who have the perception of uh, what is uh, needed. But you also need uh, new people who come from outside, who have seen different systems, who will bring diverse ideas to you, who also don't have baggage of the past, who don't have obligations to benefit somebody or to oblige somebody because that person has obliged this person. So we brought in some new talent, we recruited some new officers, we brought officers on deputation, we also brought officers on contract systems uh, and we made them all work together with the uh, existing talent and all of this has helped us to improve our administration, I would say. Now that administration includes uh, not just handling papers but for example the real estate, the house allotments or the uh, repairs of large number of houses that were in a very bad conditions, uh, uh, things like that. Second thing that we addressed was the financial difficulties. When I came here, uh, there were challenges uh, in terms of funds being not adequate to cover our basic uh, needs and uh, we worked very proactively on that. Uh, we, uh, first of all, worked on how we can save wastages. Uh, is there some money sitting in the bank account, in a current account, which can be invested? Is there somebody who is not paying the rent in a timely manner? Because if they had paid that rent in a timely manner, we would have uh, used that money and we would have earned some interest. Is there tuition fee being collected on time? Things like that. Uh, so one area was we needed to uh, make sure that we minimize the wastage. The second thing was we needed to also optimize our internal incomes. We wanted to make sure that uh, university is making its best effort to uh, raise the money that it can raise. And then once these two things started to happen, we were able to successfully get the government to also increase our grants uh, because I think it gives confidence to the government officers to realize that, okay, these people are serious about improving themselves and they are able to give them. So the second thing that I think we did very reasonably well was the financial. The third thing that I would say was a high priority was uh, the issue of indiscipline and violence uh, uh, that was prevailing. Uh, we needed to uh, improve the uh, an overall ecosystem in an academic institution if the students are not feeling very comfortable, if they are not very safe, if the teachers feel threatened, uh, then you can't have a good uh, discussion, you can't have a good academic environment. So we needed to improve the uh, overall discipline and overall ecosystem um, uh, of the university. We did that reasonably well. Having done that, the most important thing was how do we build our people? Because ultimately, all of this is meant to prepare our students better. Ultimately, that was our objective. If you are producing good, <coughs> uh, if you are having good financial means, if you are having good uh, 
administrative system, then it should go to help the students, help the teachers. And that is where we put in a lot of effort to empower our teachers. Uh, we said we will, for example, uh, not want faculty members to run around for small money, for attending a conference, for buying a small uh, chemical or buying a small uh, device, a laptop or a desktop or a printer. But we will empower them and we'll provide them the autonomy to spend some money. We also created opportunities for our teachers and students to grow themselves. For example, we created mechanisms where some of our better performing teachers and students, they could go to other institutions outside India for six months, for one year, um, to upgrade themselves, to do some good research in a, a different ecosystem. And similarly, we produced a lot of uh, new mechanisms for students to grow and improve. For example, we created Teach for BHU Fellowship where um, a PhD student immediately after submitting the thesis would be engaged by BHU as a TH for BHU fellow and would be asked to do some teaching engagement and be given some fellowship for one year. What it did was it gave a soft landing to our better PhD students. They were immediately having some engagement after submitting the thesis. It counted in their experience when they applied elsewhere for a job and it gave them time to prepare themselves for the job. Similarly, for some of our professional programs, we created one year internships. Uh, we also created a very ambitious plan for leadership quality development in our teachers and students. We have sent more than 100 of our faculty members to uh, premier institutions like IITs and IIMs for one week training in leadership. We have trained very large number of our students in leadership. We have created separate committees in every faculty for leadership and life skills. We have also built a very strong counseling service now uh, where the students and uh, sometimes even non-teacher, non-students could avail of the services of counseling. So I would, when I look at the entire uh, environment of PHU. We have worked uh, quite effectively in improving our administration, improving our financial conditions, and improving the opportunities for our students and for our teachers to grow. I have a feeling that these all will become visible in their impact in the years to come. All we need to do is to continue to put certain amount of resources, certain amount of effort to maintain these activities, uh, monitor these activities, and uh, do mid-course corrections. Any activity you start uh, is as good as you eventually maintain it and uh, do mid-course correction. If you have started some activity, you have to watch how good are the results and where are the improvements that are possible. So if you do that, I think all of these will bring a lot of uh, beneficial effects in the long run to the university. Great, sir. Sir, I think uh, the amount of effort you have uh, put up in like uh, capacity building of teachers, giving them exposure, uh, giving opportunities for PhD students for uh, going out and uh, interacting with other things. Uh, you had, I think, uh, done similar things in IIT Gandhi Nagar, which I, uh, I remember uh, a lot. Sir, uh, the uh, lastly, I uh, wish to like talk about the major burning issue in the country, which is about employability. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the, uh, like I think at the every level of the government, people are talking about this. Uh, this is a very serious issue. It has political dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many states like our elections are lost based on this issue. So, how does BHU look at uh, this employability issue? and what initiatives you are thinking about? I feel that it is our responsibility as a college, as a university, as a school to prepare our students for life, which includes employment. Hmm. Right. Now, what does employability require? If today you were to hire Ravi, a driver for your work, it is not good enough that driver knows how to drive in Delhi. 
but the driver should have the discipline to come on time mm. the driver should have discipline to be responsible mm. and to have good conduct mm. because if he is a good driver mm. but if he is erratic his behavior is not very really much up to the mark you will not be satisfied and you will find another bike i think this is where our industries have to start thinking that we should go beyond teaching the physics or the chemistry or the history or the hmm. english or the hindi hmm. but prepare student for life hmm. how do you do that when a teacher says i will not allow you to come late in the class hmm. it is not about the teacher's ego hmm. it is much more than that yes when a student learns that she or he has to go to the class in time mm. and is able to do so you are also making more employable because now when they will work in a office mm. or in a company mm. they will know how to go to office in time yes. when you tell a student that homework assignment is due on thursday mm. uh, at 4 o'clock uh, by 4 o'clock and if you say that i will only accept assignments up to 4 o'clock you are not being harsh you are actually training the student yeah. how to meet deadlines how to deliver how to <laughs> be responsible i think we are failing our young people yeah. by being very good yeah. and i have a uh, story that i tell uh, many times and i would like to narrate that story here was a uh, factory situation yeah. where a worker used to do some welding type work where he is supposed to wear safety goggles while doing it mm. because uh, there could be an accident which will put damage his eyes mm. now this particular worker was somewhat adventurous and he found those goggles to be irritating he didn't think it will happen mm. uh, that will uh, cause an accident and he was avoiding to use them every time his supervisor would walk by he would reprimand him yeah. and then this person will put the goggle on and after the supervisor would leave he will remove the goggle and it continued for quite some time mm. until one day an accident happened and this guy lost his eyes mm. so when he lost his eyes the colleagues from the factory were going and visiting the worker uh, to express their uh, sympathies and build his morale but when supervisor wanted to visit him this worker conveyed that he is very angry with this supervisor and he would not like to meet him okay <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the colleagues uh, who tried to intervene mm. they were told in no uncertain terms by this worker mm. that today i have lost my eyes because of the supervisor and i would not like to meet him he is responsible for this mm. after a lot of interventions uh, they were able to break ice and the supervisor was allowed to meet the worker and supervisor was baffled he said look throughout i used to tell you to wear goggles you never listened to me <laughs> and uh, today you are causing uh, calling me responsible for it what is happening oh. he said you should have fired me <laughs> if you had fired me i would have had eyes yes. and i would have found another job <laughs> see yeah. today if i am lenient with my student mm. if i am passing them when they don't deserve to pass yes. yeah. when i am not taking disciplinary action and disciplinary action should be taken yes. i am doing the same thing if i was a little bit strict now yeah. i would have prepared them for life yeah. tomorrow when they go in the market yeah. and they are not prepared yeah. they are not employable yeah. they would have rightfully reason to say the same thing to me yeah. saying that you should have fired me you should have failed me you should have removed me from the university hmm. it would have caused me difficulty for a year it would have called me sick faculty for 6 months hmm. i would have lost one year of my hmm. uh, college year but i would have been prepared hmm. and i would have had 40 years of better career yes. i think we as teachers we as academic institutions uh, cannot uh, look at dealing with students in a very uh, narrow Mm-hmm. perspective of what is making me popular today mm-hmm. we have to see what is it that will make us effective mm-hmm. 
so that our students will be better prepared for life. It may be a little harsh today, but it should be good in the long run. Amazing, sir. Amazing. But I am uh, I'm like I'm feeling to ask like another last question, which is about start of the year, sir. The honorable prime minister is leading that effort from the front. He talked about it, and he he always urges the universities yeah, to like look at uh, uh, students to think about the startups and entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, it's uh, one of the initiatives regarding that regard here. Sir. If you can just highlight. You see. I feel that the preparation for startup for young students starts from the autonomy that you give to them. If as parent I have given my children 100 rupees pocket money and I've told them how much they can spend for chocolate, how much they can spend for uh, buying novels and not, not letting them think. I'm really suffocating that period. Hmm. Similarly, if I were to keep my students in the hostel and say, this is how the mess will run, this is how the hostel will run. Hmm. I'm really challenging their uh, opportunity. I'm restricting their opportunity Hmm. to learn to problem solve. Hmm. When I leave my students Hmm. with autonomy to run their life, to run their affairs, Supervise them against abuse. Supervise them against misuse of uh, resources. But let them be. The students will feel self-esteem. They will feel empowered. They will feel confident. They will start to think. And they will come up with creative ideas. Yes. And you start to think of creative ideas on how to use their pocket money uh, as a 10 year old uh, kid or how to run their hostel affairs as an 18 year old yeah. student in a college or a university. You can imagine that they will have a fertile imagination eventually to start looking for opportunities yeah. where they can make a good living yeah. by contributing to an unmet need. Oh. Yes. Right? I feel that our universities need to do a lot more than what we are doing today. Oh. To give more autonomy to our students. Okay. I think in all your discussions, you always talked about autonomy for your professors, for your faculty, for your students. And you uh, always look at like delegation mm-hmm. instead of the control. I think like yeah, uh, uh, that is the overall uh, flow of ideas uh, which I uh, uh, seen here. And I think it has uh, worked well at your uh, previous stints at IIT Kanpur and IIT uh, Gandhi Nagar. Uh, should be and at BHU. And at BHU. And at BHU. Okay. Uh, when I say give more delegation, give more autonomy, it does not mean uh, abdication. Abdication. It does not mean that I am saying, okay, this is your problem. Mm. Now, if it messes up, uh, what can I do? I am still responsible. I am also still accountable. Which means that if I have let you go north, if if you all have agreed to go north, and I said, you decide which way to go north, what is the route to take, which road is better. As long as you are going north, it is fine. But if then you start going south, I am still accountable. I will have to stop you. And I will say, wait a minute. We had agreed to go to north. How come you are going south? So, any delegation that you give, any autonomy that you give, it does not mean that you are running away from your responsibility. It only means that you are empowering your people to help you To achieve the objectives. Mm. As a single person, you cannot do so much as 10 people can do, 100 people can do, 1000 people can do, number one. Number two, the ideas, the creativity, the innovation Mm. that you have is very limited compared to what 10 people, 100 people or 1000 people will have. Mm. So when you allow more people to think, Mm. you're going to come up with better ideas. 
the only challenge that happens is that if these thousand people or hundred people or ten people, they are all having vested interests, and they have their own agenda, which is different from the agenda for the investors. Yes. Yes. Then it cannot work. Yes. So I am always for more autonomy. I am always for more delegation. Hmm. But then only condition is that there has to be clarity of where we are going. Hmm. And uh, there has to be some accountability. Sure, and sir. Uh, like just to relate with it, that I remember at IIT Kanpur when I was there, uh, the some of the leading poets of Hindi were invited invited to stay at IIT Kanpur and interact with the students. And I used to have interest in poetry, and I used to interact. And it was like off, uh, awesome that uh, some of the leading poets are. Mm -hmm. Like sitting uh, mm -hmm. in front of us, and we are mm -hmm. having like uh, lunch with them, dinner with them, having informal conversations mm -hmm. with them. Several uh, thought leaders, NGOs, uh, they used to get invited for lectures, and things used to happen, and we used to inspire a lot. I, I have, uh, I, I hope that uh, like all this happens at BHU. I have no idea. So, if you can just like highlight, if like uh, something like this is happening here, or you are uh, planning in that. That so you right. See, any ecosystem <coughs> in a university system benefits by having a lot of visitors. Mm -hmm. People who come with diverse backgrounds, diverse ideas, mm -hmm. and students learn from them. Mm -hmm. So uh, in last couple of years, we have actually launched uh, programs where uh, we have a, a scholar in residence program, an artist in residence program. Mm -hmm. uh, we have invited people from abroad, we have invited people from India mm -hmm. to come and stay with us for uh, mm -hmm. one month, for two months, for three months. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the idea that mm -hmm. an artist, a writer, mm -hmm. a scholar, a philosopher, a scientist mm -hmm. uh, should be able to come and spend time with us at mm -hmm. And we all will uh, mm -hmm. become richer sure. by their presence. Fantastic. And sir, another thing. IITs and central university or government universities uh, perhaps operate in like a separate universe. Both are like uh, one is operating in engineering universe, another is operating in a uh, another universe of government administration and government uh, based or or uh, more of humanities and uh, other things. So uh, you have like seen it all, seen the uh, both sides of the coin. So are you? Uh, are you looking at uh, building uh, uh, bridges between like these two islands of excellence? If, if this is a very interesting question. I don't see IITs as technology institutions and universities are more liberal institutions. No, I don't agree with that. Huh. Uh, for example, many IITs are doing fantastic work in humanities and social sciences. Some of the IITs have now started four year uh, program for uh, beard and uh, integrated degree things like that. I don't think that is a difference. I think the more fundamental difference is right. that IITs were given the autonomy to run their matters right. at their own level, right. at the level of their uh, academic senate yes. and their board of governors, which enabled them right. to be creative, right. which enabled them to solve their challenges. Right and which enabled them to do better. Mm. If you go to different IITs today, somebody will get upset mm. that uh, in IIT X, there is a A, B, C, D, E grade, mm. while in other IIT, there is a A plus, A, A minus, B plus, B, mm. B minus grade. Mm. And in a third IIT, mm. A is not the best grade. Mm. So some IITs have best grade is A, mm. but there are IITs that where A might be the second best grade the best grade may be e for excellence okay so so i think i think that kind of a uh, autonomy mm -hmm. that kind of a flexibility that kind of freedom mm -hmm. enabled the it system to think to be creative mm -hmm. and to learn from each other mm -hmm. uh, if we were to similarly think about the rest of the uh, academic uh, system in our country mm -hmm. Allow them more flexibility, more autonomy. I have a good reason to believe that you will have a lot more outstanding uh, results from the university uh, system than what you are seeing today. Yes. So I think uh, uh, 
you have actually highlighted a very very important point so i can uh, uh, i think uh, uh, we can stop this like conversation here and it is a really honor honor to interact with you sir. thank you ravi so much enjoyed thank talking you. to you as i always do i have yeah. known you for what three, three decades now yes. uh, when were you at kanpur it 93 Yeah. 93. So yeah. exactly three decades. Exactly three. So glad. And I did not even think about it. Yes. <laughs> so my guess was right. Thank you. It is. It is a joy speaking to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.